me taking a drink of water from my cup. Hello, and we are live. Welcome to Climate Change Roundtable from the Heartland Institute, the only show that tells you, or at least one of the only shows that tells you the world is not going to end in the next hundred years. And um, uh, for, for a moment there, I thought I froze and I was like, uh-oh. Uh, and today we're actually going to talk about how a lot of people are telling their kids specifically that the world is going to end in a hundred years and kind of how they're breeding a psychological illness in kids. And I mean, it moves past kids. The, the federal government is saying that that climate change is partly responsible for the runaway inflation that we're seeing. At least they're admitting inflation is real now. And in the EU, there's something just hilarious going on that I'm genuinely excited to talk about. But before we do all that, let me introduce the people here today, which are the same people that you've all come to expect. Joining me is Sterling Burnett, director of the Arthur B. Robinson Center at the Heartland Institute. Sterling, how are you? Good, sir. Doing well. Beautiful day in sunny Texas. Yeah, jealous. I, Illinois sucks. I'm not going to go in any further into that. <laughs> Illinois sucks. That's my whole my whole opinion. Uh, Anthony had a better laugh than Lene on that one. So Anthony comes second. Anthony Watts, I don't remember where you are right now because I know you moved recently. I apologize for that. But how are you, good sir? All right. I can well, I would say the best description I could have today is I'm marginally sucky. <laughs> That's better than Illinois. <laughs> So I'm gonna I'm gonna say that's pretty good. <laughs> and and I, after right? after looking at the stuff we're gonna discuss today, it just has me in a funk, you know. <laughs> it's um I mean it's at least at this point I'm I, I hate to say it, but I'm kind of numb to it. And Linnea Lucan, I know you are in South Carolina at the moment. I'm two of three. I'm knowing where people are. How are you, yep. Linnea? <laughs> Doing great. Weather's not so good here either, so it's been yeah. okay. It's yeah. big thunderstorms and stuff, but other than that, better than Illinois. This is totally a tangent, but if I don't plan on doing something like during a day, let's say it's a weekend and I just don't want to do anything and then it storms, I'm like so happy because it gives me a good reason to say, oh, I'm staying in because it's storming when in reality I'm staying in because I, I want to stay in. So in some scenarios, storms are awfully advantageous, but past my love for using storms as an excuse to do nothing, let's talk about how uh, the left, and I don't want to blame all the left, at least... I would say most climate alarmists are on the left, which is why I just you know, say the left, but how they are, at least there's been a growing trend of them um, talking about, well, I mean, not a growing trend. It's been going on for a while. Talking about how climate change is, you know, an existential problem. It's catastrophic and it's going to theoretically, or as they say, end life on earth. And as an adult, you, if you are someone that is easily influenced by that kind of rhetoric, you can learn to at least manage your emotions. If you're someone that has the ability to reason, you can understand that that's a bunch of crap. But if you're a kid, you uh, you can't. You 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 hear this and you're young. You don't have the ability to reason, and you think the world is ending, and you aren't going to see you know your 18th birthday. And let's be honest, kids have no idea what their 18th birthday is. But an article went out this week from Vox titled. Stop telling kids that climate change will destroy their world. And I will say that when I saw this article written by, uh, who's it written by? Gotta, gotta zoom in a bit here. Kelsey Piper, that I was hopeful that at least Vox is saying, you know, stop scaring your kids. Cause Vox is usually saying the sky is falling. The world's gonna end, run. So, I, I mean, this is like a minor move in the right direction, but Sterling, I know that you've been um, kind of heated about this topic over the years, just how, how, visceral the rhetoric is from climate alarmists. What did, what did this article just make you think? Well, you know, every so often uh, the, the corporate media tries to rein in the fear mongering for kids. You know, climate change, kids, kids worry about the monsters under the bed. Climate change is the monster outside the window that mm -hmm. they've been told about now for 20 years. And so you've got these movements where kids are leaving school. We're going to Get out of school and protest. So we're not going to learn anything today. Instead, we're just going to shout about something we don't understand, but we fear. And why do we fear it? Because uh, the media has been telling us our world is going to end. AOC says the earth ends in 10 years. Uh, you know, and they constantly hear this drumbeat. And it is a lie. Their claims are a lie. But psychologists have been saying for about a decade now, that there is a new psychological illness that's especially that children are especially prone to, and it's climate psychosis or <laughs> environment psychosis. You know, it's it's kids feel um, angst ridden, 
They feel they have no future. They're completely depressed. And it's all because, not because the climate is changing, not because the environment is being destroyed, but because they're being told constantly that the environment is changing and being destroyed. They can't experience it. But because they're told that's what's happening, they have the sense of hopelessness. So we're creating a whole generation of youths. Uh, we're destroying their psychology. We're, we're making them depressed, uh, some suicidal perhaps. And uh, it's all so awful and unnecessary because the world is not ending. And so Vox is admitting this. And, and so they hedge their bet. They say, please stop caring, kids. It's not fair. The world's not going to end. And then at the very end, they say, but things are bad. So yeah. the world's not going to end, but things are bad. Well, look, they've been saying things are bad since the 70s when I was a kid. Um, uh, that we were, they would run out of food, that uh, first the glaciers were going to come because cooling was happening, that we're running out of energy. All these things, they keep predicting them. They keep being wrong. It's time to just stop telling kids the world's bad. Tell them they have a brighter future because, A, we're using fossil fuels. B, yeah. life is getting better all the time. Fewer people are dying. From weather, you know, tell them the good news so they'll have hope because that's yeah. the truth. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of these these scary stories are predicated on climate models, climate models which have just recently been shown to be impossible, such as the model called RCP 8.5. That model was the one that basically everybody cited because it was the worst case scenario. And it basically said that we are going to be seeing up to six or seven degrees of warming by the end of uh, the 21st century. Well, some other scientists, real climate scientists, a friend of mine, Zeke Hausfather, went in and said, hey, look, I've done some calculations here. If we burned all the fossil fuels on the planet, we still would not get to where this model predicts us to be. So the model was shown to be completely impossible, this climate model. And yet, they still use it, and they still use it because scare sells, and scary things allow you to control people. The left really wants people to be following the lifestyle that they dictate, following the patterns of living that they dictate. And climate change, or the threat of climate change, is one of the tools they are using to get people to conform to their vision of the future. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, Linnea, I want to get your opinion in a second, and... Uh, before I before I give mine, I just want to kind of give a, a little preface. Like I, I I've heard the whole global cooling thing, and I know that it's rejected by the, the climate alarmists today. Like, oh, we never said that. We knew what was going on the whole time. But um, the general understanding is they they did say that. There's so many newspaper headlines. I mean, it, this there's there's evidence. Like this stuff just doesn't go away. So my experience growing up um, was learning. Like I, the first time I learned about climate change was around in seventh grade. I lived in London at the time, but I had to do this whole project about why renewable energy was better than um, you know traditional energy. But that's actually not what I want to focus on. What I want to focus on is my high school experience. And I apologize for those that you know don't care. Um, I had a social studies class, which essentially is a weird way of history, but just not calling it history. But um, I had some tests on ancient Greece, and my teacher was like very, very leftist not like liberal i'm cool with liberals but like leftist um and on the test uh by the way before i go into this i just want to mention that i'm jewish because that actually matters for this this story uh there was a question or a true false question it said denying climate change is akin to denying the holocaust and i'm just like sitting there in this this class as someone that um i mean i won't say that i i fully understood the issue but i will say that i understood there was a, de a debate at the time and this question indicates there's no debate. It, it indicates that if you deny climate change, which is even at the time a ridiculous notion, um, that, that you essentially don't like believe in a, a, a genocide or whatever. Um, and and you like when sitting there at that moment, I'm just looking at it and I'm like, do I do I stand by my principles? Like I'm trying to get into college. Do I do I agree with the teacher? Just, you know, suck it up and uh, you know, it just just suck it up. And uh, unfortunately, I don't actually remember what I did, so I don't have a good resolution to this story. But Linnea, I do want to know what experience you had growing up, you know, as a kid related to the climate change narrative. Are there any, and if there's not, you know, I'm sorry for putting you on the spot here, but was there any, any like moment or were you, were you taught more of, you know, the, the point of view that the world's not ending or did you have an experience more along mine? 
No, um, I had two teachers for all of my subjects. And to those of you who aren't American, I'm not exactly sure how it works in other school in other countries. Uh, but in American public school for middle school, which is sixth grade through eighth grade, you have different teachers for different subjects like you would in high school. Um, and I had two teachers for all of my subjects. And um, both of them decided to hijack every single curriculum they had to towards the environmentalist um, bent. And that year of classes alone probably influenced uh, <laughs> my position on this stuff more than anything, because it was completely overbearing. Um, they were telling us, you know, that polar bears are not good swimmers and that uh, <laughs> that's why they're all dying because they can't, they don't have any land to go on anymore. So they're just drowning out in the middle of the ocean and stuff. And little kids, you know, eighth grade isn't that little, but, or seventh or eighth grade isn't that little, but, uh, you know, to people who aren't curious about the world, you know, necessarily, and aren't doing a lot of outside of class reading and being a huge nerd like I was, um, they just take it and they just believe it because the teacher said it and the teacher is the teacher and they're going to be right. Right. Um, luckily I, I was not that kind of person. <laughs> I, I was a little bit obnoxious about raising my hand and disagreeing. Um, but it was every single class, every single topic, they tied it to climate change or to um, acid rain or some kind of environmental issue. Uh, and that was in public school. I uh, have no uh, idea what it's like now, but it was incredibly bad. I, well, I did cause trouble in my schools, So I probably would have gone <laughs> to the principal and said, look, <laughs> uh, this is indoctrination. I, first, I would have gone to my parents and said they're indoctrinating me, and my parents would have backed me. Um, and then I would we, we would have gone jointly to the principal and said, "This is BS. You can't you can't say this." I like the idea that polar bears aren't good swimmers. Let's lock uh, an Olympic swimmer and a polar bear in an Olympic sized pool and see who wins that battle, and we'll see how good a swimmer they are. I suspect the Olympic swimmer wants no part of that. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I hope that they don't race and they just go at each other, but continue. Well, no, I mean, it wouldn't be a race, but the swimmer would, it, despite the fact that he's in great shape and may on the short term be faster than the bear, he will be exhausted long before the bear is. <laughs> uh, don't poke the bear. Don't poke the bear. Yeah. And don't swim in front of him. Uh, especially if you're, uh, you know, if you've got a cut or anything, because, that's I mean, just, <laughs> uh, be like you know, shark. Yeah. yeah, it'd be like a shark. It's just like, this is a bad idea. Uh, you know, on the list of bad ideas, that's one. <laughs> the, um, um, I want, so yeah, go leads in, oh, sorry. no, take it, Sterling, take it, Sterling. I don't know. Well, it leads into something Anthony said, it, it, it leads into something that Anthony said, uh, and I'm trying to think what it was, but it leads into the second topic, which was, Look, you're not just scaring kids. You're you're telling lies. Mm -hmm. And Anthony said it was something about they want to tell us how to live. Yeah. But to be clear, they want to tell us how to live, not how they should live. Right. There's a big difference. They, That's right. They know they know how best the hoi polloi, the average man on the street. Uh, uh, Joe and Jane six pack, you know, your soccer moms, your hockey moms, whoever they are, uh, the people in flyover country, they know best how average folks ought to live, but they think they should be exempted from that living that same way. Yeah. I mean, exactly. We're, we're, we're going to move into a story along those lines, you know, as you said, uh, I just want to, to, to point out in the comments, some of you are on Facebook, some of you are on YouTube. Uh, our most active viewers are on YouTube. So if you're on Facebook and you want to interact with more people in the chat, head over to the YouTube channel, uh, type in the Heartland Institute, you know, subscribe. We'd appreciate that. Uh, let me, let me just throw that out there. But uh, yeah, so that's just in terms of if you want to actually interact with more people. But um, Anthony, you just sent me a couple of comics, and I'll say that I've actually seen one of these before. Or you sent me one comic, and I think it's absolutely hilarious. So let me go ahead and throw that on screen, and you can take it away. One moment, sir. Um, uh, it always takes All a right. moment. Always this, takes a there moment. it is. Yeah, this, this cartoon is based on actual facts and actual pronouncements. 
that have come from the UN and scientists and so forth. And it's the same story again and again. There's doom on the horizon. It's always a few years out. And those few years out are unverifiable at the moment because they're based on climate model predictions and other scenarios related to climate model predictions. And so they keep saying the same mm-hmm. thing in different ways. And by the, t- you know, by the time you get to the end of it, and Al Gore declaims, uh, exclaims the science is settled, you go look back at it, it, it hasn't been settled at all. It's the same set of alarms. And one climate scientist, um, uh, Dr. Stephen Schneider, now deceased, made a pronouncement several years ago in a magazine interview, and he said, we have to create scary scenarios in order to get people to act. This is coming from a climate scientist. And that's why you see these things. Now, I want to go to this other uh, web page. Yeah. This guy in the UK has been tracking a complete list of all the different things that are supposedly caused. My no, bad. Not him. Yeah, no, it went away. Away. it's back. <laughs> all right. Anyway, this guy's been tracking for years a complete list of all the things supposedly caused by global warming slash climate change. And if you look at some of these things, a lot of them are contradictory. And one and um, you know, like bird loss accelerating, bird populations dying. <laughs> you know, <Bird> strikes. <laughs> global warming creates drought and extra rain at the same time. It's it's just like the the magic boogeyman of change that they believe this to be, and they apply it to everything. And the problem is, is that. A lot of the public does not have the ability to discern fact from fantasy. And that's why a lot of people are very alarmed, reasonably intelligent people who just don't have the science or the math background to figure this out. You know, uh, I, to be, to be yeah, fair, take- I don't even think it is they don't, don't have the capabilities. Who has the time? Average folks, average educated folks, yeah. we're, in, we're in a privileged position, right? We do this for a living. We look at these things daily. Uh, uh, you know, when, when my mom worked for Social Security, she didn't sit on news sites all day. She didn't have time to go to science. She was dealing with Social Security matters. Most people work, go, you know, wake up, go to work, come home, and then want to relax. And what they're not doing is constantly combing science sites. So if they watch the news, they watch 30 minutes in the evening, maybe an hour. And uh, if they're only seeing the mainstream media, that's the only story they're getting. They just don't have the time or the inclination to go look for this stuff. God forbid they turn on the weather channel during the day to play <laughs> in the background when they've got stuff going on. I had a classroom, one of the classroom buildings at my university. Um, it was an engineering science slash geology energy related building. And uh, in the main lobby area, they had the weather channel on 24-7. And I would have to sit there waiting between classes uh, for the door to open or for other classes to leave and just sitting there listening to the stuff that they say on the weather channel when they're trying to do their fluff or their, uh, but they'll do like a climate change highlight reel and they'll show a bunch of hurricanes and act like it's, you know, unprecedented. yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Sitting in that, sitting in that classroom or in that lobby really gave me an appreciation and hatred for the word unprecedented. Ah. <laughs> I'm so tired of that word. <laughs> it's unprecedented you, you, on our channel. In the last, it's unprecedented in the last 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, you, you get the you get the same thing when you're waiting at airports, right? You're sitting in the airport lobby waiting to board, and they've got CNN playing in the background. And maybe you're not paying attention to it. Maybe you're on your tablet or or whatever, but you're hearing them. And the, and if they start droning them on about climate change, what you're not hearing is the truth about climate science. You're hearing yeah. the hype about climate alarm. Well, actually, and I've s- had a lot of thoughts on this in the past, like in uh, related specifically to CNN at airports. Like mostly you're not hearing anything. You're just seeing it. And you're seeing the CNN Chiron. And that's a, a strange word, or at least I consider it a strange word. So for people that don't know what that means, it's it's the text on the bottom. That's essentially the headline. So the, the news headline. And it says climate change uh, worse than ever or hurricanes destroying more lives oh, okay. than ever before. Yeah. And, you know, you're you're an average person. And, and I think it was you that said this this episode, Sterling. Sorry, I'm always my mind's in a million places at once. But um, that that like you don't blame people for for thinking that climate change is worse than it is or that it's catastrophic because that's what they hear in the media. And I mean, we, we started this episode talking about that's what they hear as kids. 
And then, you know, you, you grow up or you, you, even if you don't grow up, you just started with this, but that's what you see in the news. Like you're right that it's, you're bombarded with this kind of thing. And, um, it the, makes sense the, that people would think it's worse than it is. Yeah. The fourth estate so. is abysmal. Um, uh, they were never objective. Let's be clear. I, I don't think there was ever a time back back in the old West. They had newspapers that were owned by different political parties in, t t in two towns, and they'd publish their own stories, their own slants on stories. But uh, the idea of objective journalism has certainly gone out the window. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it, but but the the fourth estate was always supposed to be a check on power. They were supposed to be. Mm -hmm exposing the muckrackers and exposing the lies, you know, uh, and instead they have, uh, they become uh, one more tool of the powerful elites to spread their lying message on, and in this case on climate change, it's not the only one they're spreading, but this is one of them they're spreading. Yeah. And then we had this past week, we had the meeting in Davos where all these private jets flew in oh, with people that said, you know, we have to reduce, we have to stop consumption and so forth. And they're flying in to get catered meals and caviar and, and trinkets and whatnot, you know, at Davos while they decide how the rest of us serfs are supposed to live. Yeah. All right. So, you know, thank you for the transition, Anthony. Let's let's go straight to that. Uh, as as Anthony said last week, there was Davos, but but not focusing on Davos and more focusing on the fact that they did fly private uh, planes there. Let's talk about the new EU green aviation fuel tax. Now, Sterling and Linnea, I know that you two recently wrote an op ed on this uh, featuring my favorite image of Sterling in the world on Town Hall. So I, I really wanted to reference Man, it. Three episodes. Uh, <laughs> you, you will pay. I'll, I don't know how. But you will pay. <laughs> Think uh, about all the heads on my wall and, and before you say things like that. You know, I'm, I'm <laughs> just referencing early in the episode. Yeah, Al Gore's head there. <laughs> I, I, I am intrigued that you were a troublemaker in high school. I wish I could have known younger Sterling because I was the opposite. I was like quiet and very nice. When I, you questioning the teachers, that does not surprise me at all. So, so the, the Sterling one did a little bit. But uh, yeah, well, I was so, a troublemaker, but I stood up for myself. Hey, man, uh, I respect, respect. Me, I was just like, whatever you say, teacher, I'm cool. You know, the Holocaust, climate change, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to talk about <laughs> it 10 years from now. Uh, no, more than ten years, damn. Uh, but all right, let's 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 move forward towards this uh, this EU green aviation fuel tax. So, for those of you that don't know, the uh, the European Union drafted recently include a section related towards climate change, which is related towards the you know fuel tax on planes. Uh, I don't really want to go too heavily into this because you two are the experts on it. So, Sterling Linnea, either you, I don't I don't care. I apologize for introducing both of you at once. Take it away. I'll let, let Linnea go first. There, go sure. for it. Linnea. Uh, so the, um, so basically there's a new fuel tax that's coming up. It applies to mostly just passenger jets. It does not apply to, um, commercial airlines or it does not apply to cargo only flights and it does not apply to executive jets. Mm -hmm. So private jets and large business owners shipping cargo are not going to be impacted by this tax. Uh, but commercial flights for us peasants <laughs> are so if you if you fly yes, if you're not travel peasant you know, class the next time i fly on southwest yeah can they yeah. just can they just name economy peasant class like at this point <laughs> <laughs> um so so basically uh they have decided that it is really 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 important that we tax uh air travel but not for the politicians passing the tax yeah i mean we and, and the we point is yeah, uh, I was just gonna say we named this episode, you know, climate change. Like you have to, I don't remember what we named it. Essentially, it was like we have to change; they don't. How can it be more indicative than this? Yeah, I mean, look, the hypocrisy is rife throughout them. You know, from from Al Gore owning a twenty thousand, larger than twenty thousand square foot home that uses more energy in a month than the average household uses in a year, to these guys telling us that we've got to conserve, we've got to give up air travel. And not them. They, they won't tax themselves. They won't use green fuel themselves, but everybody else does, despite the fact that their jets produce 40 times more emissions per person than the average corporate jet. 
despite the fact that a few years ago when John Kerry was asked about this, he flows, he flies to win a, a, a to, to receive an award for his climate change work on a private jet. A reporter asked him, why can you do this? He goes, well, it's uh, it, it's necessary for a person like me, basically saying I'm important. So my climate sins don't count. Um, and when they did some little investigation, they found out that his private jet use that year was 20 hours up to that time. And that was more uh, jet use than um, a single family vehicle for the entire year. Uh, or I'm not just well, one. Fuel use. Multiple. Fuel use. Fuel use. Yeah, yeah. It's like, but the emissions, the emissions. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, hold it. You, you're in the air for 20 hours in your private jet and you're producing more emissions than uh, a person produces in the entire year driving. It's pure hypocrisy and it shows and this is what uh, Linnea wrote in the article is, it, you know, it raises the question, how concerned are they about climate change or is it really about something else? And of course, it, it is about something else. It's about controlling how the little guy lives. Absolutely. Uh, let me actually show a part of the article here before we continue, just because I thought this was, well, it surprised me to say the least. Um, so if you look at the top of the screen right now, it says executive jet travel accounts for just under 19 percent of all aviation, according to the I have the little Heartland Daily podcast thing in my way. According to the consultants, while cargo traffic accounts for just 4.7% of all flights, that surprised me, to be honest. I would have thought that cargo flights accounted for far, far more travel than executive travel, which is a, uh, I guess, an interesting euphemism for private planes. Um, well, A, did any of that surprise you? And and B, like, it, it, I mean, you just said it, Sterling. Like, this, there's, there's no more blatant example that I honestly think I've ever seen of... You need you need to change and we won't like in the past, as you yeah. said, Sterling, you know, Al Gore will take an award and he'll fly a private plane there. But um, he'll he'll justify it in that like, well, I'm doing all this work. You know, I have to on my schedule, whatever. But now it's like I, I don't know if Al Gore's talked about this, but it's like, OK, we're still going to take our private planes. But more than that, we're going to tax you from from flying. And taxes are literally when, when you put taxes on something like flying or just on like an in individual activity or, or whatever the reason uh, that this is developed is because of a failed venture for carbon credits that happened oh, about 10 years ago uh, i ran a story on walks up with that.com about them putting a kiosk in the san francisco airport where travelers could buy carbon credits to offset their flight and mm -hmm. of course the left thought that people are just going to jump all over this you know oh boy i can i can clear my conscience and still fly to hawaii well, the bottom line is, is that these things were a spectacular failure, and along with carbon trading at the time. The, one of the, the markets in Chicago for carbon trading went completely bust. You know, it started out uh, like $40 a ton, and it ended up like, you know, under a dime before they closed the, the exchange. The problem is, is that they tried to force us to buy carbon credits and, and things like that, and that failed spectacularly. So... The fact that that's failed, now they have to do it the other way. They're just going to say, well, that failed. We're going to have to make you pay somehow. We're just going to tax aviation fuel. End of story. Yeah, I mean, the the, the tax is literally designed to make people fly less. That's what I was saying. It, it's it's literally, that's that's why you introduce a tax. No. Essentially, a sin tax, but it's not something again, considered a sin. It's flying. It's transportation. No, but once again, I'll stress, to make some people fly less. Us, yeah. I mean, it's not to make people, the elites are not going to have to fly less. And of course, to be fair, because they're so wealthy, even if the tax was levied on private jets and cargo planes, do you think they'd stop flying? No, nope. but at least I, I constantly hear, and I hate the, I hate the class warfare. I hate the tax, the rich stuff, but the constant refrain is make the rich pay their fair share. Well, I get, I got news. If you're going to force average folks to pay more to travel home to and from school uh, when they're coming home on spring break or Christmas vacations to go see your family on vacation to travel. If, you, if you're going to make average folks pay more, certainly the rich should pay their fair share. <laughs> yeah. And, and for them to blatantly, explicitly exempt themselves from this, it just shows the disdain that they hold the public in. I have a actually very strong point of view on this, the whole uh, 
make the rich pay their fair share sort of thing. And I, it, you know, it generally relates to the fact that the rich are writing these rules. And, but I want to, before I continue, I want to say that like, I don't hate people being rich. Generally no. rich people are rich because they provided some sort of value to society. No. You know, otherwise, I mean, you might be some sort of politician that got really rich in that case. I have no respect for you. I just want to put it out there except for, you know, I was going to say like Ron Paul, but he was a doctor. He did so many surgeries for free. I, sorry. Just Ron Paul comes into mind every now and then. But um, yeah, the idea that like rich people, rich people do create these laws. And and what, what came to mind when you were talking, sorry, was J.B. Pritzker in Illinois, who's just destroying my state that I've previously mentioned that I hate. But he actually took all the toilets out of one of his houses when a, someone that was like coming to appra not appraise the house, uh, essentially just like determine how many taxes he had to pay. And by taking the toilets out, it wasn't considered a place of residence. So he didn't have to pay taxes on it. I mean, I'm not going to 100 percent get this correct, but. Rich people, they they design these laws in a way that they can evade them. And the aviation tax is l more direct because we can actually see how it's being done. But this has already been happening for a very long period of time. It's just hitting this space that we we discuss, which is why we're bringing it up now. And when and uh, when they're not when they're not no, exempting okay. themselves, when they're not exempting themselves, what they're doing is uh, they're benefiting on the back end. So. Um, Al Gore, his home, he pays the bills on his electricity, uh, and the prices go up because he's pushing green energy, but he's also an investor in green energy. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, he's paying himself. He's paying that cost, but it's lining his pocket. And that's what's happening with so many of these guys. Well, right. I I'll wager yeah. that most of the people that wrote these aviation rules have, uh, I bet they have some, uh, Boeing stock or some, you know, some, stock in American air in, in different Absolutely. airlines. Uh, so if they pass on the cost, the, that money will be going right back into their pockets. Uh, they, they write tax laws that uh, tax them. Uh, they, they, they pay their taxes, but then they have all the exemptions, right? So um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a flim flam that if you met a guy on the street trying to pull this stuff on you, you could report him to the police and he could be arrested and prosecuted for fraud. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and we, we talk about this as their position living in a first world country, but think of this applied to uh, the third world and developing countries that um, the West looks at and says, well, you can't have coal power. We don't want you to have uh, fossil fuel energy. We don't want you to have all this other stuff. We're pulling up the ladder on these guys. And I'm yep. sure they feel just as angry about that kind of stuff as we do about uh, the elites so blatantly setting themselves up comfortably at the expense of the average person. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah, um, that's the, that's the problem writ large, right? When Western governments uh, tell, tell poor de developing countries, they can't have what we have because we caused a problem. Oh, we've we've caused climate change, and we don't want you to suffer from climate change. So we'll we'll prevent you from having all these things that made our life better, uh, as we eat our caviar and smoke our cigars, um, and, and fly our private jets, <laughs> and fly and fly our private. No, but even no, no, but even commercial jets, right? How many yeah, okay. people in developing countries get to fly, even commercial jets? Most most people, I'll, I'll wager billions of people, have never taken a commercial jet, and can't afford it now, much less if they impose this tax. The whole point is there's whole countries that they don't want traveling. There's whole countries they don't want to develop along the model that we developed. And so we throw them crumbs in aid or we'll say, oh, we'll build some, build some wind turbines. It's true your hospitals won't work at night or when it's not, uh, when it's <laughs> not, uh, the wind's not blowing, but we'll build you a hospital and, and some wind turbines. So sometimes you have energy, but not that nasty coal. Coal. Oh, you're welcome man. yeah yeah you're welcome exactly. even if they switch the coal power like how much would they need compared to the like their energy use is just so much less than ours it, it's a ridiculous notion in general but um so you know speaking about all of this uh they, we are being censored in general, our side. The tech companies don't like us. Our point of view is not welcomed. Um, we've seen that when we do these broadcasts, they they put this little warning below it. I mean, on Twitter, sometimes it says like warning, sensitive content, as if we are, you know, scaring kids like, hey, kids, you're going to be OK. This is very sensitive. And actually, this this was <laughs> this was um, kind of um, 
exemplified recently by the top Biden aide who told big tech companies to crack down on climate change misinformation. We'll see how long it takes till we get uh, a sensitive content warning after talking about this. So um, Gina McCarthy, the top Biden or Biden's top domestic climate advisor, said tech companies should do more to prevent the spread of inaccurate information about climate change and clean energy. So we are misinformation. It is time to censor us. You know, we're we're trying to tell kids that they can survive. This is this is the right course of action. Would you agree with that, Anthony? Right, right. You know, a few years ago, when Gina McCarthy was, uh, I believe she was um, part. Yeah, she was head of the EPA for a while, and she went before Congress uh, before the Environment uh, and Science Committee to testify. And one of the people on the committee asked her if she knew what the Im amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was, how many parts per million. And she just sat there with deer in the headlights, blank stare. She did not know. And yet this person here is going to tell us how our climate misinformation is, is hurtful and so forth. She doesn't know jack squat. She's just a figurehead. On the bright side, people can pay for, for carbon offsets. Well, <laughs> Yes, this, Look, this website here, you can, you can, you know, sure. print out a certificate, a nice certificate suitable for framing to show that you have you have printed out, earned by the virtue of your ability to type on a keyboard, <laughs> uh, you know, a million carbon credits. And you can display that. And then when your liberal friends come over for, you know, wine and cheese, you can point to that proudly and say, see, I have offset this party. What have you done? <laughs> I once got a Facebook ad that said I could pay like 30 bucks to buy a one inch plot of land in Scotland, which technically made me a Scottish Lord. Didn't do it, really wanted to. This kind of reminds me of that. Sterling, uh, uh, we cut you off there a bit. What were you about to jump into? Well, um, honestly, it, it, it oh, <laughs> so talk, speaking of people in the administration, uh, the energy uh, secretary, is it Whitman? Uh, uh, Chris, uh, the, the former governor, former governor of uh, Michigan, she was bragging uh, about. Um, um, she was bragging. I'm having a Jennifer senior moment. Granholm? She was Granholm, Jennifer Granholm. Yeah, she was bragging about how she got her electric car finally delivered, and she drove from Michigan to Washington D.C. and passed by all, all those gas stations, not having to, not having to pay those crazy prices. Won't it be great when everyone does? What she didn't say is. That's a 700 mile trip. There's not an electric vehicle that can make it. Uh, it, it it's 700 miles. So what she didn't talk about is how many hours she spent in downtime charging that vehicle. Multiple yeah. days. I can drive 700 miles. I know because I've done it uh, multiple times. I can drive 700 miles in 12, you know, in a day, easily in a day. I can't. And uh, stop three times, two times for gasoline along the way, each time taking 10 or 15 minutes if I go in and uh, get a soft drink or something. She couldn't do that. I guarantee you, not from Michigan to Washington, D.C. She had to stop overnight. She had to stop multiple yep. times overnight to make that yep. little jaunt. But she passed by all those gasoline stations. So how much did she pay to the hotels that she had to stay at? Or did she sleep in her electric vehicle? Maybe she did. Uh yeah. You know, and who was paying for the charging that she had to do? It's they are such liars and hypocrites. It's just offensive. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the charging stations now are showing up at Target. Right. Uh, Target has put in charging stations all over the nation at their stores in the parking lot. So, you know, you go into a town and maybe the only charging station available is at the Target store. Well, there's an ulterior motive there. You've got several hours to kill. So what are you going to do? Go shop at Target. How much more money are you going to blow in Target than you would have spent on gas? Go figure. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, and are they are they fast charging stations or not? If they're not fast charging st stations, yeah. it's not several hours. It's 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 you know overnight. If they are, you get a twenty to eighty percent charge. But you know what you do there? It turns out that you wear your battery life down if you don't fully charge it. So. <laughs> the life of your electric vehicle, or at least a battery pack that goes into it, declines. Uh, the, the easy the way hidden, to solve this is to tow a fat. generator. Tow a generator and have it charge your vehicle as you're driving. And that way you never have to worry about battery life. I saw <laughs> the funniest video of that exact yeah. scenario, Anthony, where someone had a Tesla and they were making a long trip with it. They had a, they had a Honda generator 
in the trunk that when they ran out of uh, juice on the side of the road, they walked to the nearest gas station, filled the diesel generator, uh, the Honda generator, and uh, powered the car that way or Very charged the car that way. And someone who had, you know, a good Samaritan who had pulled over to uh, help them out because they were clearly struggling with something on the side of the road uh, was just filming it and laughing. And they're like, don't you think it would save you a couple steps if you just bought a Honda vehicle <laughs> instead of... <laughs> <laughs> buying a Honda generator. The only thing that makes sense as far as electric cars go as a hybrid, where you've got a gasoline engine and you've got electric assist, and the two work in tandem with each other. The gasoline engine keeps, or the diesel engine keeps, the, the batteries charged for the electric assist. Everything works out great. And that's why Priuses are so successful, despite the fact that they have the sort of left-leaning stigma to it. They're very practical cars, except when it comes time where you have to replace the battery pack, and then you get the sticker shot. Or, or when you have to tow a boat, or <laughs> take a take a whole. Would you? Could uh, you tow a boat? <laughs> in my car, I sure can. I couldn't yeah. in, in my mom's electric uh, hybrid. That's yeah, the point, I mean, I is there's a lot of things you can do with a regular large vehicle that you can't do in the Prius. It's good for gas mileage, not much else. Yeah, I agree with your general point of view, Anthony, but like I also believe in the subjective value of uh, goods and services. Like we objectively speaking, you are correct. But if someone has a subjective, which essentially means uh, not entirely logical, when I, I don't mean that in a negative way, I mean that in a positive and uh, real world way and they want an electric car, great. I will not subsidize it. That's that's where my point of view comes from. I don't care if people want electric cars. I don't care if electric cars take over. If they do, Perfect. fine. As it's long as, I, as I'm not by force yeah. made to pay for part of that car. That's, that's really just the line for me. Like I have nothing against renewable technology. I have nothing against uh, electric cars. I have everything against subsidies towards them. And, and I want to, for our viewers right now, uh, people talk about fossil fuel subsidies, how we need to end them. They're so big. To be clear, they're they're way smaller than renewable energy subsidies. But I'm against those two. I don't know where you all stand on that. I'm against all subsidies towards all forms of energy. No, like the best forms of energy no, win in the no is at all for any form of energy. No yeah. subsidies at all for any form of energy. And let them compete in the marketplace. I'm with you. I don't care yeah. so long as it satisfies the needs. And people should have that choice. But believe me, you want to talk about sensitive nature that they're going to have to label the idea that people should have the choice. <laughs> that's the most <laughs> sensitive thing at all that our social media will try and censure. Because remember, they're trying to censor the idea that we should have free speech, yeah. uh, choice and speech. Oh no, no, no. We can't have that because some people that we don't like will speak. Uh, well, you know, some people will make choices that other people don't like. And uh, that's the kind of thing will be censored going forward. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're going pretty long here. I wanted to play some videos. I'm going to do one of them. We're going to cut off within eight minutes. But uh, this is Janet Yellen. She recently, and for those of you that watch In the Tank, which uh, you know I produce on Thursdays and this show, I'm going to replay a video. I apologize. It really fits with both shows. So for our repeat viewers, um, bear with me. But yeah, so this is Janet Yellen speaking uh, to Congress. And she spoke about essentially the state of the economy and how renewable energy and, and just this, this whole thing fits in. So I'll, I'm just going to play it. Given the global nature of these markets, it's virtually impossible for us to insulate ourselves from shocks like the ones that are occurring uh, in Russia uh, that move global oil prices. And look, over the medium term, the critical thing is that we become more dependent on the wind and the sun that are not subject to geopolitical influences and passing clean um, energy credits that will boost um, non-renewables um, is, I think, really, really critical to, um, to, to, to addressing climate change and our uh, energy costs for households well, going Madam forward. Um, give uh, so, so, yeah, I'm, uh, there like are two words here. Salad. I don't want to play all of them. Essentially, she's talking about the state of the economy, inflation, high energy costs, and then how renewable energies or renewable energy is the solution to that problem. Uh, Linnea, Sterling, Anthony, all of you I know can devour this entire point of view. So whichever one of you three wants to take it, go. 
Linnea, take it. <laughs> All right. Um, I mean, heck, where do you start? <laughs> <laughs> the, so the, the whole idea that pushing more renewables is going to help us lower energy costs is idiotic. Ludicrous. Yeah, yeah, it's completely Absolutely. insane. All you have to do is look at California, and Anthony knows that better than anyone else. California's grid is legitimately on the verge of absolute collapse, uh, especially if they keep pushing people to depend on the electrical grid more and more by banning, you know, they ban small gas powered engines um, and are only allowed to use, you know, electric lawnmowers, electric uh, weed whackers and stuff. They want everyone to get on electric vehicles. They've recently are pushing to go um, no cars that emit more than like a Toyota Prius by something crazy like 2026. I, I don't have the exact date. So uh, pardon me if I get it wrong, yeah. but just insane sure, stuff that. like that. Um, more it's, and more dependent really on the electrical grid. taken hold. It really is. And, and I left California. I moved out of California in January after living there since 1987. When I went there, it truly was the golden state. Opportunity was all over the place. Uh, the cost of living was good. Everything was in line. But then when they got a supermajority of Democrats in the state legislature on both the Senate and the House, then things started to change. And in 2006, when Al Gore pushed the... Uh, AB 32 Global Warming Act and Schwarzenegger signed it, all of a sudden things began to change. Cost of electricity started going up. Cost of gasoline started going up. Some of it was tax related. Some of it was market driven. But I, I, you know, you see these computers behind me right there. I have a whole room full of those, about 100 of them that runs uh, a variety of different weather processes. And my electric bill would just become insane during the summer months. Sometimes it got as high as four to $5,000 per month to run 100 computers. And it was because they created this tier system in California where they penalize you more the more electricity you use. So in the summertime, you know, unless you live on the coast with the elite where you've got the cool ocean breezes, you have to run an air conditioner in the interior because the temperature gets up to 110. But we're going to penalize you and make you pay more for running that air conditioner or keeping your computers cool or whatever. And it just became untenable. And I had to go. And a lot of people are leaving. A lot of my friends on Facebook are leaving. California is basically killing the golden goose. They're no longer the golden state. Um, in terms of opportunity or the cost of living. I have two thoughts, mostly not related to everything that was just discussed. Anthony, you have <laughs> the greatest voice for just like broadcast and all that. I can see why you were on air for so many years. I should have, I, I just like earlier in this episode, I thought that, and I just, I've been, you know, wanting to point that out. Second, well, thank you. Our, our, our comments are, uh, we got people defending electric vehicles. We got people, which, you know, cool. I, as I said, like, I'm totally fine with them. Just don't make me subsidize it. We got people. Got, like, pushing got, back. I am auto neutral. I am power neutral. Let them compete in the marketplace and see what wins with people's choices. But I will say this. Mm -hmm. So um, concerning Yalen, yeah. anyone who believes her claptrap needs to take economics 101. Inflation is caused by government spending, by government printing dollars. Mm -hmm. And you know when the government printed a lots and lots and lots of dollars when no income was coming in? During the government-imposed shutdown of the economy. And then they were cutting checks to people. They said, you have to stay home, but recognizing people had to eat and pay their bills, mm -hmm. they, 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 they printed money. And so we're paying for that now. That's economics 101. The other factor, she's right about this, is energy prices. But those prices were rising long before there was ever a Russian invasion of Ukraine. <laughs> yeah. And and Biden has done everything he can, contrary to what he's saying. He's, he's, he's working uh, uh, like the devil to uh, solve the gas prices. And then everything he does makes the situation worse, makes it harder to develop domestic oil and gas. He goes, he, he, he calls the Saudis, what did he say? I don't know if he called him a rogue regime or something. He said he wouldn't deal with the Saudis. He hated the Saudis because they, uh, you know, their, their prince killed the uh, the reporter or had the reporter killed. But then this uh, week uh, he's meeting with those guys uh, saying, please, please provide us oil because I'm not going to let us do it here. He wants OPEC yeah. to bail us, out, to bail him out. So she either doesn't understand inflation. And in fact, I know she does. Or she's just lying. 
because inflation is caused by government spending. And, yeah, and the, the section of it, that the, the portion of it that's caused by energy prices is directly related to Biden policies. Yeah, for those of you that don't know, and I probably should have done this right at the get-go, and if you haven't Googled it yet, Janet Yellen is the um, Secretary of the Treasury currently. So just wanted to throw it out there right as I'm about to wrap up the podcast. But before I do, Sterling, we got, a, we got someone here in the comments who's very anti-you. His name is... Luke Stark and Luke, old Luke. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you've been monitoring them, but H. Sterling Burnett knows nothing about electric vehicles. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, I, I guess um, I guess that would be uh that would be of interest to the articles I've been cited in peer-reviewed literature on electric vehicles. But uh Luke. maybe Luke, maybe Luke compares favorably, but my suspicion is uh and I don't know. I, I don't know to, anything about Luke, yeah. so I won't speculate. I'll try to draw up the conclusion to like two minutes long so we can give Luke time to uh, respond with some of the stuff that he's been cited in. Yeah. Full uh, disclosure for Luke, I've owned two electric vehicles, both of which are dead now. Yeah, my computer is entirely frozen. They didn't get a million miles, Anthony, because I'm, I've am i just read that they get a million miles. And I just came with up With no Sorry. battery pack changes. Yeah. With no battery. No, that... I, I would wager even nobody makes that claim. Yeah. Well, I'm still not seeing anything from Luke. Luke, you've got a few more seconds slash my computer keeps freezing. So, you know, you might, you, you might get another 45 seconds if I'm not able to end the broadcast. Thank you all for joining us today. We are live every Friday at noon. Follow us on YouTube. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're usually on Rumble. We weren't today. I noticed you in the comment that pointed that out. Uh, you can blame me for that. I apologize. But normally you can watch us on Rumble, which is a free speech platform because YouTube is actively censoring us. Our channel has been kicked off for over a week before, and we actively have to decide what we broadcast every week to determine, you know, our next, frankly, our next strike if uh, will we'll be a longer, you know, before we're allowed to post again. And our third one, they will permanently kick us off. So we are actively being censored. Um, you know, Biden's top aide, I don't remember your name, but you are getting your wish already. I appara apparently it's not enough for you. So damn, that's I don't I don't really have much past that. Thank you all for joining us. I'm not gonna go through the rest of it. We will catch you all next week.